I've been trying to talk about the uh, I've been trying to talk about the Good Samaritan for a while, and we did some kind of lessons building up to that, and it goes along with the idea of getting involved in people's lives. You may do your best work with only one or two people. I, I've been so blessed lately. I'm having conversations with my niece, which I have not in years. My niece, Melissa, and she actually listens to the, uh, the preaching art, and uh, that's my only fan. But some of them, you know, uh, some of the family, my nephew, is that her brother? I can't keep him straight. David. David has been on heroin off and on, off and on, off and on. Many of her kids have been on drugs and in prison. So now things are turning around, and she is on fire for God. Amen. On fire for God. And so I'm thinking, who would have who would have thunk that God would have did what he's doing in my family's life? It's still going on. The seed that we sowed years and years ago, some of them said no. Some of them said yes later. Some of them said yes right then. Our Kathy's, uh, our, uh, what is he? How's he? Your, 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 yeah, first cousin husband was, I didn't like the guy. I thought he was pretty arrogant. And he never showed any religion around us at all. And he, he died, he was 60, 63, died of a heart attack riding his bicycle. So we got to finding out more about him. You know that he must have got saved. He's in the First Baptist Church in... Travelers Rest, South Carolina. And listen, he's on the mission board. He's on the mission board there. And I'm thinking, oh, that's sounding good. God's doing stuff. Satan's hindering you. And it's little things that he's going to get you out of your game. All right. That's all the time we have today. <laughs> the Good Samaritan. The good, I should probably read the scripture. Everybody got a Bible? Don't stand. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? See, now this, is, this whole parable is a response, and Jesus is answering that question. Where are you at? Yeah. 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 Luke chapter 10, did I not announce that? How many heard me announce that? That's about 99% of you. Twenty-five. <laughs> Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? How come I don't have this sound? Boy, oh, that really helped me. He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Or what would you do with that thing? Oh, here it is. All right, I'll get with it in a minute. We're cranking up. You're ready to go. The engine's warming up. Start from the beginning. <laughs> nope, not going to do it. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, I am worthless today. Okay, now here we're rocking. Here we go. All thy mind and, and thy neighbor as thyself. That's the heart of the law. If you were going to get to heaven by works, that would be how you did it. But Jesus, his whole parable is to illustrate to this lawyer that you can't get to heaven by doing good works. You can't get to heaven. You don't have enough love. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself. This is a self-righteous person. They come in all shapes and sizes, all economic backgrounds. Uh, you can recognize them as a Christian instantly, the self-righteous. 
But he will him justify himself and said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment. That was a common thing. That little pathway through the mountains, I think about 12 miles, out of Jerusalem to Jericho, and it's just a little path uh, between the mountains. And people, they knew, you, you know what? I, I realized something the other day. We have the ability to have more insight, I believe, in reading about these Old Testament things or New Testament things, uh, you know, old Bible days, because we can back up and see the, whole, the big picture. They could not see the big picture. That was such a common, common illustration to them that they didn't get it. But we are able to back up and see the thing and learn about all this stuff and understand what Jesus is saying. So he's, he's, he went down to Jerusalem, Jericho, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance there came down a certain priest that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Priest had that the priest was symbolic of hope. He was the one that was so close to God, he could go further into the holy of holies, the places the average person couldn't go. He was a symbol of hope. People need hope. But you're looking at the wrong place. And he saw the man for fear of the robbers or fear of contamination. That was a ritual thing. He passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite. Levites, a little less prestigious than the priest, but well respected. If you wanted to crown somebody's shoulders, if you wanted to talk to somebody you thought cared, you would go to a priest or a Levite. That's why it is with a preacher. I was just talking to Julie from Port Orchard, and she's just going through some rough, rough stuff. And I was sharing with her some things that I've been through, we've been through. And uh, people, when they talk to a preacher, you know, they, or they talk to somebody that's a, a spiritual person, or you assume's a spiritual person, they really have, oh, here's somebody who can give me answers. I, I tell you what, I have to find answers for myself. And once I find them, then I can help somebody. Likewise, a Levite, when he sat at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, when he came to where he was, when he saw him, he had compassion on him. The Samaritan, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. And I grew up in an area in a time when there was a lot of racism. And it's not that everybody was a racist, but every, you know, the people that were the leaders in the family taught us racism. Right. And that's why we have to come out of it ourselves, and I did. Amen. But they taught it, and it was, it, it was just prevalent. By the way, I'm glad you're seated down. Buckle your seatbelt. There's racists in the Northwest. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The good Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went to him, bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, set him on the beast, and brought him to an end and took care of him. He, they hated each other. Uh, the, the Samaritans were half Jew and, uh, and half Gentile, and so they hated each other. And they would pray... The Jewish people would pray, God, please, don't let me look on the faces of a Samaritan today. <laughs> That's how bad it was. Isn't there's nothing more idiotic than racism. I mean, it really is. And people, I've met people here that were that way, and in certain groups, I guess because I got a southern accent, they think I'm one of them, and they come to me and say, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. God made us all. He did, and he did it on purpose. On the morrow, when he departed, took out two pence, gave him 
gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, whatsoever thou spendest more when I come, I will repay thee. He said, Now, which of these, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Good Samaritan, <laughs> Uh, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. You're trying to be neighbor. He wouldn't even say the word Samaritan. He couldn't say the words. He said, I guess the guy, like we would say, the guy that showed mercy on him, uh, then said, Jesus, go and do likewise. And he's not teaching him that you live by the law. He's teaching him, if you think you can keep the law, Love that much, and that guy could not do it. Man, his friends wouldn't talk to him anymore. He'd get kicked out of the synagogue. They found that he'd been trying to help, uh, uh, you know, involved with uh, or said the word Samaritan. So Jesus is answering the question behind what the lawyer has said. Uh, we look at the priest and the Levite, the priest and the Samaritan. Uh, and, and the thing, I try to have a, a sort of a purpose statement when I preach. And sometimes I know I've got a point, but it's hard to articulate that point. I'll write it down. I, I did that today. I thought, what am I trying to say? And, and one of the things I'm trying to say, my point is this. Do what you do for God. Do it on purpose. The Good Samaritan is not what you are, it's what you do. Now I want to say this, the primary teaching of the scripture is you're saved by salvation through grace. It shows and typifies a sinner. We are, we are the, the Jewish guy that's been beaten up and robbed. And we're, at the point, we're half dead. And Jesus is the good Samaritan. He shouldn't help us. But he did. And everything that good Samaritan did is what Jesus did in symbol. He came, he poured oil, type of the Holy Spirit in our wounds. He bound us up. He clothed us. He took us to an end. He paid for our future recovery. Things I like about the Good Samaritan, he's willing to get involved. The whole idea was this. We had kind of some mixed reaction. I fully understand it. You know, we're trying to help the homeless people. And, and uh, uh, some of the people that come in, are uh, uh, most of them are really good. I like the cat lady. How many people like the cat lady? Raise your hand. Chris, I know you got a crush on the cat lady. You might as well get... He's always talking about the cat lady. I wonder if the cat lady's here. Yeah. She's a sweetheart, and we love the people, we want to help the people, we have to, so we think, wait a minute, you know, some people can go to sleep at night, and they are so warm and cozy, if they give the thought to the homeless out there freezing to death, well, it's their fault, and it's this and it's that, and some of us occasionally wake up and say, boy, I hope there ain't nobody out there freezing, hope there ain't some old person out there freezing or some person, and a lot of folks have mental uh, uh, issues and stuff, like Chris and William, but, <laughs> and me. But the thing is, it got me thinking about how much help should we give people? How far, not just that area, but every area of our life, how much of ourselves should we give up how much of our life should we give up to help other people? What's the best help you can give? Yeah, that's a good start. What's the best help you can give somebody that's unsaved? Salvation. Tell them how to get to heaven. And that's the greatest thing you can do. You help them physically. I tell people, I tell them right up front, they say, why are, you, why are you helping us? I said, I got an ulterior motive. I want you to go to heaven. That's, that's the goal. 
So the Good Samaritan ignored racism. The Good Samaritan had money, had the ability to help. The Good Samaritan had a good name. The Good Samaritan was generous. Our church should be a Good Samaritan. Let me say this really clear. There are people who, if they die in their condition, are headed straight to hell. And they are doing works. They are spreading religion. They are feeding people. They are clothing people. And they say to Jesus one day, did we not do many wonderful works in thy name? Do you get that? Not just in any, in Jesus' name. We're doing this and this and this. And they give to charities. And I say, thank God, because the more they do, the less we have to do. Our primary uh, focus is the gospel. Amen. And sometimes you got to get involved in people's lives Amen. to give them the gospel. Compassion is based on need, not worth. God loves every, and I'll tell you the stinking, nastiest person that you can find on skid row on drugs and booze and everything else. Those people, God loves just as much as he loves you, and I don't know how he does Amen. it. Amen. I don't know that I can do it. It's one thing to sit in the church and talk about our compassion and talk about being a good Samaritan. It's another thing to get out there with the nasties. I got coffee breath. I'm so self-conscious of it. So I got this. I just squirt a little advanced arm and hammer toothpaste in my mouth. Is there anything worse than bad breath? Boy, everybody's self-conscious now. Get a little mouth, mouth wash and swirl it around there and see how people are attracted to you. They want to be around you. Some people are nasty. They're cigarette people. I don't know what the difference. Some people smoke a cigarette and it's almost pleasant. Second hand smoke. I got two people in this church smiling. Thank you, Anna. Three counting. A and B. Uh, there's... There's nasty, give me a witness. There's nasty cigarette people, and you wonder, what are they smoking? And then there's nice cigarette people. It's a nice, clean, fragrant aroma. And we don't want to be around them. We don't want to be around the bums. But you know what? We all are kind of in that category. That's, you, know, you know who gets witnessed to more than anybody? Homeless people. Down and out. I've witnessed the homeless people before. And, uh, and I joke with some of these guys because they're not really homeless. They've just been through some stuff and a lot smarter than me. But we, I'm going to joke with you. You know that. But we... we I've talked to people. I say, hey, can I give you a Bible? You can put it in here in my knapsack with these other six. <laughs> they get gospel tracts. They get the word of God. They get witnessing. They get, sometimes they get help. But there's a repulsive thing about people, right? Obnoxious people. Why are y'all looking at me? <laughs> witnessing the people that just drive you nuts. Witnessing the people, reaching out to people that don't need food, that don't need shelter, that don't need healing, but they got horrible personalities. Whiny people. Whiny complaining. Listen, we got to hit those two. Those are wounded people. There are people that, that have been abused, and I know people over use that today, but there are people really that have been abused that have been through things that are just horrific. 
and it's affected the personality. Oh yeah, I can tell you some stories. And we've got, we've got to get through that wall they've got up to get Jesus to them. They're wounded. They're laying by the side of the road and we don't see them. Compassion is based on need, not worth. Here's a man robbed and wounded and left for dead. Would you help him? Compassion feels something. A certain Samaritan, he had compassion on him. Not even a Jew came to help his own people. We're so busy living our life and Satan has, has us in such a tailspin trying to survive that we don't have time to help other people. It's interesting the, the wording that's used. Good Samaritan. It's, it's a very vivid picture. It comes, the, the, the Good Samaritan, the love, the compassion he had, it comes from the word uh, our bowels, intestines, our inner, inner workings, our, who we really are, the, the, the depth of our, of our soul and our heart. It comes from, compassion comes from the deepest part of who we, we are. <coughs> the Samaritan saw the same pitiful man lying in agony beside the road, and his heart churned for them, for him, within him, that he could not pass by. It's what happens to us when we're living our life, lollygagging around, having a good old time and sporadically helping people, sporadically praying, sporadically reading our Bible, sporadically coming to the house of God when we feel like it. Ain't it nice to give somebody a blanket at Christmas? Ain't it nice to feed them a Thanksgiving dinner? I think it's miraculous that God enabled people to survive on one meal a year. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Compassion stirs us. It troubles us. It keeps us awake at night until we do something. My wife is one of the most compassionate people I know. Me and my son-in-law joke about her and our daughter Stephanie. Kids are, aren't, boys aren't that way. If they got something, if there's one piece of pie, the other person's going to get it. If there's one left, they'll give up in a heartbeat to make other people happy. I, I, I think about this so often. We went to North Carolina years ago, and Casey, you were part of that, and Paul Melton, I don't know who else, came in and sort of remodeled our living room. I can't remember what all they did. Painted? Been a few years, Casey. Been a few years. Painted, fixed it up. I remember coming in, walking past the grandkids. Wait a minute. I'm looking around and saying, good Lord, this is fantastic what you did. It was just beautiful. It was so thoughtful. My wife comes in. She takes a quick look around. And I know it meant more to her than it did to me. And she smiled and hugged the grandkids. Made me look bad. I shoved them out of the way. After she loved on the grandkids, then she looked around at what they had did. Compassion feels something. You're going to have to let your, your heart feel something, and it's going to trouble you. It's going to take your time. You're going to touch something dirty. You're going to be around people that's got all kind of troubles. What a lady lived with us one time. She used to come to church. She was suicidal. 
And I'm not saying I did the right thing. I had to sleep dressed. I had to be ready to wake up in the middle of the night. We had to hide all of our ropes, knives. This came from the counselor. And uh, I went with her to her counseling. And uh, the counselor told me, now, a person that's suicidal can be homicidal very easily. And we're driving down the canyon road. She's driving. She says, I don't want to live, preacher. I said, I do. And I definitely don't want to go that way. I've got a, a terror of heights. It'd kill me before I ever hit the ground. We've had, uh, we don't do it anymore. We've had people live with us. John Reed and his family, his daughter was born here in town. I'm her godfather. I'm a godfather. What about that? I'll make you a deal. What is it? You can't refuse. <laughs> So he helped him because he was needy. Compassion not only feels some compassion does something. Compassion does something. We get up and we do something. And we do it for an ulterior motive. We're doing it for Christ and we're doing it to get people to Jesus. Most of most people that get saved get saved because somebody cared. And they helped them. So compassion does something. It causes you to move. It transforms your life. You know what? I'm a pretty good witness now. I'm a pretty good witness. I give out tracts almost every day, and it's not hard. I talk to those six people, I could barely talk. And I witnessed to them. And they said, yeah, we go to this church, and they all gathered around, and, and we, we were having a conversation. I said, so all of y'all are saved. Out loud, in front of God and everybody, I said that. And they said, yes, we are. Amen. Which is the only way that Save people respond. Listen, I'm a pretty good witness. Now, I'm not a great soul winner, but I'm a pretty good witness. But do you know that it took me about 30 years to get to where I'm at now? Because I had a house and a garden and kids played sports and we were just, had it so easy. And we helped missionaries and it felt so good. Didn't it feel good? And I was a deacon. Paul Sunday school, son. But it took me about 30 years to realize my life is not my own. You ought to be a soul winning machine. God is shocked if you're not. God is disappointed if you're not. Compassion does something. Those, what, six verbs are so expressive. He went to him. You got to go to him. I've witnessed the people I don't feel like it. I've helped people. I get calls every week to help people. We can't help all of them. But I get calls every week. You know what we do now? If it's possible, I say, you know what? We're going to help you, but you've got to come to church. And a lot of them will come. Some of them won't. They don't get help. If you're not going to church and you don't have a job and you can't get off your end and come to the church of God, you're not going to get helped. Thank you for agreeing with me. Amen, preacher. Tell it like it is. So, he went to where he was. He bandaged him. Wrapped him up. There's some people, all they need is hope. Mm -hmm. I've told people this sometime. I say, you know what? I know what you're going through. It's going to be okay. I told Julie that today. She's having a rough time. I said, it's going to be okay. You're going to make it. You know how many times I've longed to hear somebody say that to me? When I was so downed. I'm so discouraged. I might joke about it, but I appreciate it. 
when they know you're going through trouble and just say something to them. Open your mouth. I'm working on a gospel track. I'm working on a book about the death of our pets. Still going to do it. And I'm working on a gospel track. And the title of it, I'm going to find scripture for it, is Open Your Mouth. God, help us. Compassion does something. It calls the Samaritan to feel something so deeply that it had to be expressed in action. He went to him, bandaged him, poured in oil and wine, set him on his own animal. He didn't move away from the injured man. He moved toward him. Would, would that same man have helped the good Samaritan if he was in the same shape, wounded, half dead? Probably not. Art said something this morning, so absolutely true. We're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and we've rationalized things away and we've told ourselves, I'm saved, the other stuff doesn't matter, I'm just a sinner, and we're lazy and we're sorry and we don't care. Call it apathy. We call it don't care in the South. We don't care. And we're going to get at the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to expect something you ever, you ever messed up at work? I've done things at work. I told you about the time I called. I'll briefly do I called at work and jokingly said I was the owner. I'm coming in. I want the place clean. I thought the lady knew who I was. She didn't. She thought I was the owner. I saw the look of panic when I got back in with my truck. I said, what's going on? She said, the owner's coming in. The, the, the supervisor's flipping out. He's getting all the paperwork ready and it's a small company, you know, and they're cleaning up their vacuum and I'm like, did he call? They said, yeah. I said, what time? Oh, about 2.30. I said, I think that might have been me. <laughs> Do you expect anything different than a good butt chewing when you mess up at work? He called me in his office. He said, John, he said, that was funny. But he said, please, don't ever do that again. I said, I don't think I will, Ed. <laughs> Just wanted to make a point. Do you think that we are going to be able to witness to our aunts, our uncles? Oh, I can't, preacher. I can't, I can't do it. Because I don't want to get involved with this person. They've got issues. They've got needs. It's going to mess up my time. It's going to mess up my life. I can't, do, I can't have them around my kids. Josh used to witness when he was a kid. He'd beat kids up if they didn't get saved. <laughs> he said, you want to get saved? They said, no, why not? You don't like Jesus? <laughs> We don't want to get involved with that person that just went through the divorce at work. It's going to be a lot of trouble. We don't want to get involved with that person that's in jail. My wife went to court the other day with somebody. That the lady called her daughter's in jail. It doesn't it feel good to go to jail and you not being the one in jail for a change? Yeah. <clears throat> You guys are doing good, but you're not doing great. Some of you ain't started yet. You got to be pretty. You got to be looked up to. You got to be respected. When you should be opening your mouth, you should be walking over to where he's at, wounded, half dead, in need of Jesus. We're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to get chewed out like you can't believe. We're going to get we are going to get crushed. Tears are going to flow. And you know what we're going to say? We're going to think, I didn't think it was real. I didn't know you were an austere man. Remember that scripture? I, didn't, I thought I could just float by. 
I didn't want to swim up river. I didn't want to give up my life. I'm talking about me too. More you than me, but <clears throat> this is serious stuff. Let's be the church that figures this out. So when we stand before him and other people are weeping and say, I, I, I could have helped. Do you know that we're going to be at the great white throne judgment? We're going to watch people thrown into hell that we know. And you're not going to say to them, hey, buddy, how's the farm going? How's your job going? How's your stuff going? Hey, we're not going to say, hey, buddy, did you see the game? What about them Seahawks? What about them Mariners? And the angels are going to cast them in hell. And you think for one minute they're not going to look at you and say, why? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you try? Yeah. Why didn't you come to where I was? I was half dead. You're going to stand at that judgment seat. Compassion calls something. Take care of him. He says, I will pay you. We cannot do this for any reason but Jesus. Forget about your hurt feelings. You know what? You want to talk about, I've had my feelings hurt in church. It's not that most people would have just quit. And if I could have quit, I would have quit. But I couldn't. Got nowhere else to go but Jesus. Compassion demonstrates our relationship to God. He showed mercy on him. Do it for Jesus. He's watching. This stuff is real. Hey, guess what? All this stuff is real. Amen. Just think of today's newspaper that never gets old. God's telling you your future. And we're going to get up to the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be funny. I might snicker. When we get up to the judgment seat of Christ, it's like, well, I didn't, what, I didn't know, but I told you. Yeah, but it was so plain. <laughs> it was so simple. Jesus didn't come to take part in our lives. Came to take over. Dr. McGregor said that. He came to take over. <clears throat> there ought to be a stamp on our life that we don't get our feelings hurt and quit, that we don't go through rough stuff and quit. Boy, I feel better now. I've been wanting to chew y'all out for a long time. <clears throat> God is good. We are getting there, but you guys are moving. You guys are doing stuff. Keep it rolling. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's be that shining light. Mm -hmm. Let's look for the, for the wounded. Tell them there's hope. That's all they want to hear. Just tell them there's hope in Christ. But the, the Good Samaritan is, is a great chunk of scripture because it, it holds a mirror up to us. As a Christian, when we read that, it should be pretty uncomfortable when we read that because we should start to ask ourselves, which of the three are we that passed by the, 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 the man that was half dead? And if we're honest with ourselves, we're, we're probably not the good Samaritan. And as a lost person, you should see yourself as the half dead person. Uh, and if you, don't, if you don't see yourself as that person and you've never accepted Christ, uh, I, I ask you to open up your heart. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God as we pray. Um, let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house, Lord. We thank you for the privilege to listen to the gospel today. Pray that as Christians, Lord, when we read this scripture, that we're honest with ourselves. We pray that you would reveal our hearts to ourselves, Lord, and that we would be the good Samaritan, Lord, that our lives would be a life of helping people, of reaching out, not only with their necessities, but with the gospel, Lord. We pray that if there's anyone here that's in that position of being half dead, Lord, they've never accepted you, that you would convict their heart, Lord. Show them 
their path. Show them what they really are, Lord. Help them to be honest with themselves, Lord. Don't let this, don't let this thought escape their mind. Don't let them go back to living a comfortable, quiet life. I pray that you would disrupt their hearts and minds until they come to you, Lord. And we pray that if there's anyone here that's like that, that they would, they would go back to the back after church, ask someone, and don't leave here without making that decision for Christ. We just thank you again, Lord, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.